Hi everyone, it's Quickie Baby, and welcome back to World of Tanks. And today, I've got a full tank review for you of a brand new Tier 8 Swedish premium heavy tank. This is the Tornvang, and it's going to be available inside Loot Crates starting this Thursday with Holiday Ops 2022. The Tornvang is going to be the god of the hull down capacity with a tiny turret that's pretty much unpenetrable from anything but the highest pen Tier 10 gold rounds inside the game. But before you get super excited, there's a lot to really not like about this vehicle. So without a shadow of a doubt, the most like vehicle that's currently in the game of the upcoming Tornvang will be the Tier 8 American heavy tank. It is the T-34. That's one of the oldest Tier 8 premium heavy tanks in the game. We can see that the 120mm on the Tornvang is identical with regards to damage per minute with a four round rate of fire and penetration to the T-34. And this carries over to the gold rounds on the Tornvang as we can see that they are again identical with regards to penetration to the T-34. Although their shell velocity definitely is very nice at 1450, adding on 45% compared to the standard rounds. Now one thing that I'd like to highlight about the Tornvang is that it actually loses a substantial amount of penetration over distance, even though just like the T-34, they both have APCR rounds. You're down to 230 millimeters of penetration at 500 meters for your premium rounds compared to the T-34, which still packs 255. So a bit of an interesting kind of change there for Wargaming. This is almost like a tier 10 light tank with regards to that, and that is not a good thing. With the standard rounds losing 25% of their penetration over 500 meters, unlike a T-34, which only loses 10 millimeters of its penetration. Now, when you compare the Tornvang to the T-34 with this regard, this is a really high penetration gun. One of the highest penetrations of any tier 8 premium tank, and its gold rounds are absolutely staggering to have on a heavy tank. This vehicle has absolutely no problem with going through the front of most vehicles, even up to tier 10 with its standard rounds. And if you do load the gold, well, yeah, you're compensating for probably the aim on this tank. Just like with the T-34, this gun is old faithful. It will consistently deal damage, of course, if you're able to use it because its gun handling is fairly mediocre. Now the aim time on this tank looks wonderful, right? 2.3 seconds. Everybody's going to be looking at it in the garage and thinking, oh, that's mag magical, right? And then you take a look at the dispersion values on this vehicle. Now the moving dispersion isn't very bad at 0.14, but it has 0.25 turret traverse dispersion that is horrific absolutely utterly make sure you have snapshot on this vehicle and you might even want to take a directive to double that effectiveness to be able to improve this a lot of people will want to take vertical stabilizers on the tank but spoilers more on that in a second another thing that absolutely sucks about this vehicle is its accuracy 0.44 Wargaming want to try and do everything that they can to stop this vehicle from sitting on a ridgeline and sniping at things at decent distances. It has huge shell drop off over distance and also 0.44 accuracy means that you're not going to be very accurate at all, unlike the T-34 which feels like a sniper in comparison. One thing that does rock about this vehicle however is its 10 degrees of gun depression which allows you to completely dominate a ridgeline, although not nearly as good as the Emil's 12 degrees and I, I feel that Maybe Wargaming at one point were thinking about giving this thing 12 degrees of gun depression, and I think they thought better of it. So now onto the mobility of the Tornvang, and this is, again, terrible news for the vehicle. It's limited at 32 kilometers an hour forwards, which puts the top speed limit of the tank all the way down, with super heavies like the KV-4, the VK-7501, and even the real super heavies like the Oho or the Mauerbrecher. This means that this tank feels truly sluggish, and it is not something that is going to be racing to a ridgeline. Accordingly, I really feel like I want to put a turbo on this thing in addition to those vertical stabilizers. The reverse speed on this vehicle as well is lackluster at 12 kilometers an hour, making it tricky for you to be able to pull back behind a ridgeline, unlike most of the Swedish heavy tanks in the game. The power to weight ratio of this vehicle as well is very lackluster, unlike the recently buffed T-34s horsepower, although the vehicle's ground resistances are rather nice, unlike the T-34s, which is quite ironic because the T-34 will be faster on hard terrain and when you've improved the ground resistances it will be faster on medium terrain as well, but it's actually slower on soft terrain whereas the Tornvang manages to overtake the T-34. Nevertheless, this is an incredibly sluggish tank and the only way that I was able to stop myself falling asleep when I was playing this vehicle was to put a turbo on it. 
So now we'll move on to the armor of the vehicle, and this is the highlight of this tank. 260 millimeters of frontal hull, 280 millimeters of frontal turret, with 50 on the side of the hull and 90 on the side of the turret. This thing is absolutely tremendous. And if we take a look at the 3D model of the vehicle, we can clearly see that this thing is an absolute behemoth. It has 260 millimeters on this mid plate of the hull. So good luck trying to get through that if you're a lower tier tank. You'd have to have excellent penetration like the Tornwang to even have a one in five chance of being able to go through it. Its upper plate at 70 millimeters thick is an auto ricochet, but do take advantage of the slightly weaker sides of this vehicle, especially if the Tornwang is not working a ridgeline and it decides to side scrape against you, as if you have about 250 millimeters of pen, you've got a 50-50 chance of going through that. And if you do load the gold, well, now you're pretty much guaranteed to go through that when it's trying to side scrape. But really, if you're a tier six tank, you might not even be able to go through the lower plate of this vehicle as it is 100 millimeters thick. And when the Tornwang angles like this, some tier seven mediums and even tier eight vehicles are only going to have a 50-50 chance of being able to go through that lower plate. Now, what is absolutely outrageous about this vehicle is the turret armor. Even when you're not using the gun depression of this vehicle, we're talking about 350 millimeters of top turret armor, 400 above, right at the top of the head. And even underneath the gun of this vehicle, it's 300 millimeters of effective armor. Even if the Tornwang is using its gun depression, which makes underneath its gun a little bit weaker, you're still going to have 270 millimeters to be able to get through. So even some of the highest pen gold rounds in the game still aren't guaranteed to be able to get through this. And remember that the Tornwang isn't really going to be exposing its neck unless it's trying to shoot at your hull, and then you're going to be ricocheting off the top of the vehicle. Your only other sneaky chance against this tank is this plate that's on the back. It's actually quite flat. And it's only 100 millimeters thick, which means that if you manage to catch this and you can, and it's hiding most of its lower plate, you have a chance of being able to get through here. It's rather tricky. If you do manage to get above the Tornwang, however, it's got very overmatchable upper hull armor, so you can take that to your advantage. But your main way to be able to deal this thing is to get the side. Its side armor is only 50 millimeters thick, and if you can lock it down with its tracks here, that's how you can dominate it. And remember, it's got terrible DPM, so there is an any other tank apart from maybe the 122TM that shouldn't really go all in against this vehicle and try to overpower it with raw firepower. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, there are going to be loads of these coming out with the loot boxes. And I can tell you, if you sit in front of one of these, you are going to have a bad day. I know that in some situations, you're probably going to be thinking, there's no way that I can flank it. I would rather just go in at it if it doesn't have any support and at least tr out trade it with my DPM. Do not sit in front of this thing. Go back, flank, try and do anything, try and call for an ally, try and get another vehicle to be able to help you. This thing is the god of hull down, but at least unlike the Emil or unlike the Kranvang, the thing isn't dumping out three auto loading rounds and then reloading very quickly as well. In addition to formidable armor, this vehicle has a great old slammer hit points at 1,600. And for a heavy tank, its camera rating isn't the worst, but I still wouldn't recommend getting concealment on the crew as it's very highly pressured as you only have three crew members, but it works well with the Kranvang. One thing I must mention, however, is I hate the view range on this vehicle. 360 meters means that you are not able to spot for yourself unless you also use coated optics on the tank but are you starting to see a problem here? And that is that I want to use vertical stabilizers to improve the vehicle's horrendous gun handling. I'd kind of like to use an aiming device on this thing to improve its horrific accuracy. I want to use vents to make everything better. I want to use a gun rammer to kind of improve its horrendous damage per minute. And I want to use a turbo as well because the vehicle is incredibly slow. Yeah, we've got some problems here. My personal recommendation for this tank, and remember, you should build it how you feel fit, only way that I could have fun with this vehicle was to use a turbo, a gun rammer and vents and to have a second loadout on this vehicle where I drop the gun rammer for long range maps where I'm going to have to try and do some spotting and use coated optics instead. Even with my incredible crew from the Kranvang with situational awareness and recon, brothers in arms, a premium consumable and using bounty vents on this tank, I'm still only able to get up to 432 meters view range even when I got all of the field mods. And talking about them, the ones that I would recommend to get on this tank is 100% all-terrain suspension, 100% accuracy to improve that horrendous dispersion on this tank. 
I would personally take the periscope electric drive, although I wanted to bang my head against the wall whenever I got hit by artillery after taking it, but I have to, otherwise my view range was horrendous. And then I personally took a mobility slot because I think the turbo makes this vehicle actually feel playable. And while I feel like there's enough to talk about all day about this vehicle, why don't I just show you? So we're rolling out on Minsk. Now I'm taking the turbo, the gun ram, and the vents here because it's, it's the only way that I was able to really enjoy this vehicle with the mobility. Looks like that old Proto AMX-30 has either paid or grinded enough to be able to get that vehicle and is looking forward to being a good little boy or girl and giving Wargaming all of their pocket money to be able to get the uh, the Tornwang. Yes, which is going to be obviously coming out this Thursday, right? Oh man, this this time of year is always relentless with the premium vehicles. I grinded for that Alt Proto AMX30 on my free-to-play account, and I do not like it very much. As I said in my tank review, it's probably one of the most boring tanks I've ever played. And um, yeah, uh, yeah, this thing also kind of falls into that regard. I thought the things probably couldn't get any less interesting, but here we are playing dubious tank design in the form of the Torenbach. Now, in this kind of a matchup, I was thinking, do I want to go towards the east? Do I want to go towards the west? I decided that I could go and rock and roll on the west and try and go and get hulled down because that's what this vehicle is all about. It's just a shame you're so slow to be able to get into position. I've been holding down my W key this whole time and it's taken me a minute and 15 seconds to be able to do 400 meters in this vehicle. And that is with a turbo on this vehicle and that is also with a half decent crew as well. If you get this vehicle from a loot crate and you haven't got a really decent Swedish crew with brothers in arms and off-road driving and that kind of thing, oh my lord, this thing does feel like an absolute clunker. Talking about being an absolute clunker, yeah, the, the fuel tanks just seem to exist everywhere on this vehicle. The fuel tanks are here, it feels like the fuel tanks are there, it feels like the fuel tanks are everywhere. Um, I lost so many fuel tanks and had to burn so many repair kits on this vehicle that I ended up getting frustrated in using a large repair kit because otherwise I felt like I was just constantly either locked down with my, with my repair kit on cooldown. And now you are going to see where the Tornbang is actually a pretty darn good vehicle. Okay, you've made it into position, and now you're going to just sit in front of vehicles and they can't pen you, and you're going to hope that your 0.44 accuracy doesn't let you down, and you're going to be able to get the shots in the turret, and you've got more than enough time to be reading your team uh, talking about what's going on on the other side of the battle. Honestly, while I was playing this, I was almost thinking, well, shall I attack? And then you realize I can't attack, because if I attack, I expose my lower plate. And if I expose my lower plate, this pattern's going to be able to rip me apart. And I don't have the DPM to really go into the dip to be able to fight the Progetto or be able to do anything there. No, I've just got to sit here in this position and hope that my shells hit the pattern. Did you see when we turned the hole there just how much this reticle bloomed out? I'm quite happy that I managed to hit my first shot on the pattern, and I've already blocked a thousand damage this game. Two rounds from the pattern and one round from the Pantera. And I can only just imagine how interesting this game must be for the pattern, with not a hope in hell of actually managing to go through the Torn Vang. The vehicle doesn't have a weak point on top, it just sits here and it just completely creates a stalemate in the gameplay. And when they end up getting bored and they make a mistake, then maybe they expose their half-weak turret or maybe they expose their hull, then the Torn Vang punishes them. But it doesn't really have the mobility to be able to make a flanking play. It doesn't have the DPM to make an all-in play. But it does have the resilience to sit there in one position and not in allow you to use all of those other skills that you've been able to learn in World of Tanks to be able to maybe try and be progressive or take the fight to the enemy team. No, you can grind a medium tank. And look, in the, in, the, in the couple of minutes since we arrived in this position, I'm pretty happy with the 1,200 damage. The problem is, is that how many of you think that games of World of Tanks don't actually last all that long these days? And I feel as if I'm a, I'm a spectator, honestly, when I play this vehicle. The whole of the other flank melted. Was that because I didn't go into that position? Well, I would argue that if I was over on the other flank, then I probably would have lost this flank as well. And then the game would have just completely been a disaster, right? At least I've kind of held on to this flank against a superior number of players. And now, this is where the Torenfang, I found, actually did pretty darn well. When it just sits in a position, 
and it's hull down, and people try to come and attack it. That is how I felt. It's incredibly good at holding a position. And when I say incredibly good, I'm, I am I need to kind of prop my head up here slightly at trying to avoid falling asleep while I'm, while I'm having to even spectate. Like, that's the most interesting thing we've seen so far. The fact that the T-54 sat on top of that T-69 and managed to shut them down. And that's why I feel I'm calling this part of the vehicle a slow, painful death. Both for the enemy and also for me. Um, I can just sit on a position and there's practically nothing they can do unless I expose my hull armor. As soon as I tried to push round to go after the S1, things got pretty boring. Will this Progetto be able to go through me though? He bounces one shell, bounces a second shell. I decide I want to take the S1 with me in some kind of petty revenge. And spoilers, we are going to get swapped. And yeah, again, probably the most other part of the exciting thing happens, and that is the Progetto decides to park himself on me and the T-54 as well. Well, at, at least we kind of had an exciting ending, even though, yeah, um, I did feel this one was pretty slow and painful. And I'd also like to clarify as to while we do manage to smash out 3,200 damage, I would argue at least half of that was done when the game was already over and we were just trying to, like, pick up the dregs of the game rather than actually being able to be involved in it. So now we are joining a game on Ghost Town several minutes into the battle and I want to show you just how uneventful this vehicle is. What we're going to do in this situation is just sit there. We're going to expose our turret and we've already bounced one gold round from the Badger that's a tier 10 British tank destroyer that lots of people are trying to grind to be able to get right now. And a second round into the Badger there as well. We're going to bounce a third gold round from the Badger. And for some reason, they're just going to sit there and allow me to go to town on their lower plate. And the Badger, once again, is going to ricochet another gold round off my turret. Because this thing has probably the best armor tier for tier in the game, I would say, on its turret. It rivals, I think it's even better than the Kranvang, because when you're playing against a Kranvang, at least you can try and shoot the Kapolas on top of the vehicle. The Torenvang doesn't have that at all. And even this tier 10 tank destroyer is unable to be able to go through us. And so when you're in these kind of situations, when the enemy don't start loading gold, and let's be honest, gold doesn't even really work in the game anymore against thick armor like this one because it doesn't splash as it probably should do, and there's no artillery on the enemy team to be able to punish you, you could just do really silly things. Profit, right? I give a big thumbs up to the 268 behind, and that badger is probably raging and smashing their keyboard around and wondering... How did they just manage to lose everything and probably about 30,000 credits to a tier 8 premium heavy? Later on in the battle, I want to show you that sometimes you can get a little bit overconfident in the Tordenvang and you can suddenly think, wow, everything's going really good for me. I should take my chances. So of course, I try to use the 0.44 accuracy against the tiny weak point on top of the VZ-51, but even a tiny weak point is still an opportunity to be able to fight back unlike you can against this vehicle. Now I'm going to try and find the weak points on top of the KV-4. And while I guess I could have aimed just a touch longer there, I didn't really want to expose myself to the people up on the hill or even to, you know, even a Kranvang that's down here. The DPM on this vehicle, oh, you can see I have a little bit of a hissy fit there, shaking my, uh, my sniper view around, as unfortunately the ridgeline caught in front of us. And this is the problem with the vehicle. I'm not using vertical stabilizers in this tank. And because I'm not using vertical stabilizers, it means the gun handling is quite awkward. Luckily, we managed to hit the side of the VZ-51 there. And we've managed to block 4,000 damage this game. Deal 1,600 damage nearly and 1,200 spotting. This thing is an oppressive, stalemate, ridgeline brute of a tank. It is... In my opinion, really dull to play, and I'm really not looking forward to playing against these tanks as well. They have enough penetration to be able to go through you reliably. They have armor that is you, you're unable to be able to deal with. And good luck calling in the non-existent artillery in World of Tanks these days. In that situation, I probably should have fired there at the VZ-51, but I decided that I didn't want to. I guess because I was thinking that maybe I could get an extra shot in or it just didn't even feel right to fire when there's a pineapple in the middle of your screen instead of the kind of normal reticle that a tank would be able to have. So I decide now to take the fight to the enemy team. 
And look what happens when the Kranvang has... Sorry, not the Kranvang. The Tornvang has to go on the offensive. So my shell bounces. Unfortunately for me, I could have probably aimed that one a little bit better. The KB-4 actually pens a heat round into me, meaning that they don't even have the top gun on that tank. I bounce the TS-5 and I decide to try and go again. And I don't even know where that shell goes. Did the ridgeline just jump up and catch the shot? And instantly, I realize... Bad Tornvang, what are you doing trying to attack? Just go back to what you're good at, and that is sitting there in front of vehicles and just going, come get me, mate. Yeah. 4,800 damage blocked in this game now. This is... It's uncounterable. There's nothing you can do in this situation. Previously in World of Tanks, somebody could have fired HE at a vehicle like this. In this kind of a scenario... The, the enemy just has absolutely no chance. It's not counterable. There's nothing you can do apart from maybe trying to fire underneath the gun and firing gold rounds there. And you're just in an incredible, horrible, awkward, awful stalemate of a tank. Okay, so we're going to go and try and take the fight a little bit more towards the enemy team. We're going to try and get a shot into the, uh, the TS-5 or the concept. But again, bad quacky baby for actually trying to push and not just sit there hold down and exposing my hull armor. The Concept 1B, spoilers, is probably going to see what's a Tordenvang. I would like to get a kill on one of those, or maybe it's a community contributor who likes to sit there and suffer playing very boring Swedish heavies. And so you can see the Concept 1B is now making a beeline towards me. He's literally driving through half of my team all the way across, just going straight towards us. We're going to put a shot into them, and even though... We turned the vehicle by tracking them, and we get 771 assistance there. The concept was still able to snap a shot into my hull armor somehow. I don't even know that what that was. I was thinking it was a high explosive round at the time, and yes. What you got to see here is what the tank is good for. Sitting and waiting, and you also got to see what happens to the tank when it tries to be aggressive and offensive against its opponents. So welcome to chapter 3. Now we're going to be playing on Safe Haven. This is where it almost goes right, but then you realize you're also playing the Tordenvang as well. So at this point I believe I have my final field mod on the vehicle and we should be able to start to get up towards the 36 or the 37 kilometers an hour. Although, even with the turbo on this vehicle, inside a mobility slot that we took from our sixth field mod, the vehicle still feels rather clunky. So we're going to try and hit this bulldog here at the start of the game, and... Oh well, a lot of heavy tanks could miss, right? Not just the Tordenvang. But it just feels so oppressive driving around in this vehicle that I'm just kind of hoping for luck with every shot that we're going to be able to take. But then again... Look, I may be being a little bit harsh on the Tordenvang here. Maybe I'm being a little bit harsh. It's definitely not my kind of vehicle, boys and girls. But hopefully you'll also see now that it can actually be truly monstrous if you're given the chance. Do you see how I'm kind of angling my armor perfectly here against the IS-3A? We managed to ricochet two out of three shots. Oh, what now? Even my bad DPM is going to be able to handle you, IS-3A. And just like that, the Tordenvang has actually ended up being quite oppressive against the IS-3A. However, ooh, Arty, 300 damage? Ooh, gosh, please know more about that. And the SU-101 above me, even when stunned, nearly managed to get a round into my side, but luckily we managed to finish them off. And this is the way that I like to play this tank. I like to use the turbo to get into a position and then try and use my armor when I'm hiding my lower plate and my gun depression to try and punish my opponents. I really think that without a turbocharger on this vehicle, oh, just looking at it now and going up slope at 11 kilometers an hour, oh my lord, boys and girls, this thing is an absolute slug. So we've made it high up here, and we're going to turn the turret, have a pineapple, but we're going to have to click anyway, and each time I feel I am just rolling the dice with this tank to hope that I'm going to be able to hit. And it's a sacrifice that I feel that you have to make. I guess you could kind of drop vents on this tank to be able to use vertical stabilizers, but that would kind of defeat the point of making everything about your vehicle worse. So considering you don't have the view range, can you really afford to give up what little view range you can get from having vents on the vehicle? It does feel rather tricky. 
We're going to try and push forwards here because this game is starting to look like a win. We're going to fire one at the Lerba, and I'm very lucky because I'm going to get 663 spotting. I quickly get out the way of the Patriot so we don't manage to block him. Don't want to mess him around there. And we see the Lerba fire, so of course we're going to come around the corner and get a good shot in there. Just like the Lerba, just like the T-34, this gun in those kind of close quarters situations does feel rather darn awesome and just oh so consistent so we should be able to get a shot right through here right use a med kit gonna fire through yeah have a little bit of a, a shake of the mouse there there were quite a few mouse shake moments when i was playing this vehicle boys and girls unfortunately wargaming only gave me about um 12 hours, less than 12 hours with this vehicle. I played the tank maybe about 15 to 20 times. And I will fully admit that in none of those games did I really end up having fun. I'd also like to clarify, in none of those games did I end up truly sucking. The vehicle was oh so darn consistent. But this is a pretty bold statement here. I don't really get up in the morning thinking, I want to go and play a T-34. That's what I want to go and do. However, I would rather play a T-34 than play the Tornwang. Because while this vehicle does have better turret armor than the T-34, at least when I'm playing the T-34, I don't almost feel like I'm cheating when I'm in that perfect position. It does feel as if your opponents have no hope. But the sacrifices that you have to make to the tank to be able to gain that situational advantage of being able to give your opponents no hope just feels so incredibly taxing and painful and you feel as if you're just lumbering around the battlefield as a bit of a tourist whereas other more competitive heavy tanks are bombing it around getting stuck in and rocking and rolling so we're going to try and angle our armor here against the borask looks like they missed the first missed the first shot and hopefully they're going to miss the second darn it oh well good kill managed to get a tortenfang congratulations to you mr borask Pretty good game here all in all though, 2,700 damage and 2,000 assistance as well. You can see I was really trying to get into that end game position of being hulled down against my opponents. And the Boras did exactly the right thing. That is, take advantage of fighting this thing. It's got bad DPM, doesn't have an autoloader, get stuck in and finish it off. So as you can see here, these are dangerously old school artillery numbers. And that is the issue that you have when your vehicle focuses all of its armor as being well angled or front loaded. Whenever the artillery shells splash underneath the tank, they hit the side of the tank, they go on top of the vehicle. This thing is taking huge chunks of damage from artillery. I took so many 300, 400, 500, 600 damage shells from artillery playing this tank. And when you're so slow lumbering, you have to aim forever and you don't have the DPM to be able to cut through the situation. It was very painful to play in that regard. All in all, results-wise, I was very consistent with the Tornvang. And our first game, we managed to do the most damage in the battle. Although I would argue that half of that was dealt at the end when the enemy team were all playing like zombies and giving up their hit points frivolously. In the second round on Ghost Town, even in the worst possible matchup, playing against tier 10 tanks, we're number one on experience and I felt like we put in a consistent effort. And I think if there's one good thing about this tank is that it will do well against tier 9 and tier 10 tanks purely because it has armor that works against any tier in the right position. And then finally on Safe Haven with 1,207 base experience and nearly 5,000 combined, we make a decent profit of 87,000 credits. So all in all, the Tornwang, what do I think about the vehicle? Well, it's a very efficient ridgeline tank, borderline if not OP, when it's inside that role. This thing just sitting in a position is uncounterable with the fact that there aren't very many artillery playing the game now and high explosive rounds just being absolutely demolished. 
I would actually go as far as to say that this is very poor tank design. It's a boring tank to play and it's a horrible stalemate of a tank to play against. I am not looking forward to having this go into the game as I have no idea what I meant to do to be able to try and counter this thing if it just sits in a position. And let's be honest, some positions in World of Tanks are just so strong that you can't really afford to let an enemy tank have it and you have to do that dirty grinding to be able to get them out of the position. And you just can't do that against this vehicle. Even tier 10 tank destroyers are going to struggle to be able to go through this thing's armor if it's using any of its gun depression. Without a shadow of a doubt, this tank is a novelty inside the game. And I'm sure there will be some people who get this tank that absolutely love just sitting in a position and not having to really think about moving or doing anything, just keeping their gun towards their opponents. And I just think that it's incredible that Wargaming have managed to create something that is just so darn toxic if it gets itself into the right position for the whole flow of the gameplay, but also have somehow made this tank feel so incredibly boring, awkward and frustrating to play in the first place. Anyway, ladies and gents, boys and girls, that's it for today. Hopefully you enjoyed this tank review. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you hated it, give it a thumbs down and let me know in the comments what you think about the Tornwang. Do you think that it looks like an incredible tank? Are you going to gamble to be able to try and get one? Or do you think that it looks like a bit of a dull tank and there are better heavy tanks, more enjoyable ones to play in the game? And make sure you subscribe to the channel as in the next few days, I'm going to be releasing full tank reviews of the M4Y and also a real spicy meatball of a tank in the form of the Caliban. And as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been epic and hopefully I'll see you soon.